God, listen, dude, if you're not excited about the market right now, then something's wrong with you. Like, you're not paying attention. I'm sure you guys, you know, that were flipping were loving that, right? And now you're thinking, oh, crap, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> you're losing money on flips now, but this is what the market was supposed to do. This is uh, Mother Nature. I'm more of a buy and hold guy, so I flip houses constantly as well. I buy my flips at the courthouse. You know, I just pay cash for foreclosures at the steps and fix them up and flip them. So that's my flip game, um, but I, I don't even love that game because I'm paying taxes on that money. I, I love to buy and hold big properties and you know, I love the tax write-offs. It, it pays itself off. I have cash flow and appreciation. I don't get that with flips. I just get immediate income that I get taxed on. That's not attractive to me. So the flipping game for me is just somewhere to just play around, you know, play around in that space. But honestly, if I didn't have partners I loved in that space, I wouldn't even be flipping houses. I would just be buying and holding as much as I could and just playing Monopoly with the whole thing because, you know, you buy great locations and, you know, maybe sell, you could sell the bad locations that you realize are not as great of locations and just continue condensing your portfolio into an amazing portfolio. And by the time you die, you're passing down this amazing portfolio to your heirs. When you're flipping houses, you're just paying taxes. <laughs> but but you know on the on the flip side of flipping i'm also a real estate agent and so i make a lot of money on commissions and so in, in essence that's flipping right because i'm taking a property and getting the seller to agree to basically a net figure and i'm making money on top of that net figure and i'm selling that property to somebody else it's really the same thing i'm flipping and i'm, I'm paying taxes on that money you know for people that aren't real estate agents flipping is pretty much you're a real estate agent you're taking a property and you're selling it for more money and to keeping the rest you just don't have a license you know if that's your source of income and you're really good at flipping i don't like that for a main source of income because there's there's risk right you can lose money on flips um you know, it can be risky at times. It can also be risky when you walk in and you find out there's $100,000 worth of rehab that you didn't know about underneath the uh, drywall. Um, everything's rotten or it had termites or something weird. That can happen. Um, it's fun, right? Now all this stuff is, is, is so fun. There's so many different ways to make money. And right now is an incredible market because everybody's confused. Like, uh, you know, the consumers are confused. They don't really, um, you know, some people think the market's going to crash and burn, you know, uh, worse than 2008. And, you know, some sellers are living in, you know, <laughs> they're, they're eating, you know, Willy Wonka's chocolate and they think that we're still in 2021 and everything in between. So it's interesting. And the name of the game is people. Um, understanding how to communicate to people, understanding how to talk to people, um, you know, getting to know people, understanding what they're trying to do and trying to figure out how to help them do it. Um, you can slow play everything, right? You're, you, you know, yeah. the definition of a shark is someone who is basically, you know, you're sitting in the grass, you know, you know, watching everything. You understand everything happening. You see what your prey, let's just say that they're prey. They're not really prey. You're trying to help these people. And you can, you know, like, once, you, once you harness the power of communication and you understand market cycles and what's happening in the market and you can, you're really good at, I hate to use these words, but manipulate people into telling you what they're trying to do. That's a power, that's a superpower. And you can use that power for good or evil. I use it for good, right? I manipulate my prospects into telling me what they're trying to do because I genuinely wanna help them do it. I don't even care if I make money on the deal. That's how badly I want to be connected to people because I know long-term, the long-term um, the long tail of relationships is worth so much more than one deal. You know, if you help someone, they remember that forever and they're going to want to come back to you and do business over and over and over again. Um, you know, so always keep that in mind. Um, so we can go so many different directions <laughs> with this conversation, as you can see. And um, I'm more than an open book and happy to share everything and anything. So um, I told Naaman, is that how you say it? I told Naaman that, um, you know, he's like, what direction you want to go with it? I'm like, whatever's going to help you guys, you know? So, so let's do it, man. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested to hear more about you, you guys, what you're doing, what you're into, what your you know, problems are and what I can do to help. Yeah. Well, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate you, you know, jumping on here and letting us 
pick your brain here. And uh, I know a lot of get a lot of these DMs. This is the way you serve a lot of people um, at one time and connect even more people. Because I'm just like you with that. I'm like, how many people can I just collect and, and serve and help? Uh, because that's going to equal the greatness, right? So I know you as the guy that trains real estate agents. Um, that's that's why I connected with you because I'm starting to shift a little bit more towards agent outreach, uh, doing deals on the MLS, even considering you know getting my license and stuff like that. It wasn't has not been the case for the last few years. Um, that's not how I was doing my business. So I'm starting to make those connections now, uh, so I can add this to my wheelhouse moving forward. So I want I want to ask you, you know, what's a way that um, I'll, I'll open up with the first question? What's a good way for an agent um, to work, or a good way for an investor? to reach out and work with an agent? How should that conversation go? Um, and it, and like for context, you're talking about, you know, creating the relationship so that the agent basically gives you deals or that you work together on, you know, um, properties you need to sell um, and, you know, but more so sending you deals and keeping your pipeline full. Yeah. Sending you off-market deals. Yeah. My lower offers. Yeah. The market. I want them to list my property, you know, competitively and work with. Them. I think it's like anything else, you know, just building the relationship. When you can make them feel comfortable with you, um, you know, it, again, guys, it comes back to communication. If you're really good at making people feel like they're part of your family, that's it, right? And that comes from tone and genuine curiosity about people. Um, and being a great conversationalist, um, and you don't necessarily have to be an extrovert to. Um, to, to know to master that because I'm definitely not um, but I do enjoy learning about people and talking to people and um, figuring out exactly what their motivations are and what they're trying to do so with real estate agents you know what do they want you know what are their motivations well they want to sell properties and make commissions and if you can put them in a position where they they're comfortable with you and they feel like you're going to you know, be a good client for them, then they're obviously they're going to want to do business with you. I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> there's not too many agents that are going to turn down business, right? You know, like even if they don't like you all that much, they're probably still going to try to sell you something, right? But if they do like you, think about that scenario and you know how you could be at the top of their list of investors who see those off market properties before anybody else. So again, I mean, I'm, you'll probably hear it a bunch, but it, for me, it's all about how we're communicating and what our real intentions are. You know, listen, I, I hate the mainstream, you know, coaching and training, you know, of trying to close deals. And I, I don't know what you guys subscribe to or what the, I have no idea what you guys are up to as far as you know, like cold calls and closing deals and stuff like that. But I absolutely do not do objection handlers and, um, you know, oh, well, you know, you don't want to sell. Well, if, if I could do this, would you sell then type stuff? Um, or, or even who do you know that might want to buy or sell anything? I just, I'm not into any of that. Uh, and I'm definitely not into trying to just close somebody that's not really interested in, in closing. Um, because what it does is it, it crushes the relationship I could have with that person long term that turns into so much business. What I'm more interested in is, you know, here's who I am, here's what I do, all right? What do you want to do, right, and why? And when I can- You made a lot of money yesterday, Ricky, you didn't even know. I, I listened to a bunch of your podcasts before we did this, just so I can have context. And exactly what you just said is what you said on one of the podcasts I listened to. So when I was talking to my seller, obviously we're doing all the objection handling stuff with all these distressed properties and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I just listened to what my seller was saying and found a way to be the solution without any of the extra stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And the guy went from like, he gave me a 10% discount on a, like a very good retail property, um, yeah. which was enough for me to get the deal done. And I was like, this was amazing. But what I was doing before was trying to close this guy. Yeah. Based off of, you know, what I thought the extra strategy was. See, see, that's what's very interesting is because when we all start our careers, we get caught up into the mainstream coaching and training and scripts. And we kind of start out, see, we get into the business and we think, I want to help people. And then we get into the business and we get some coaching and training and we realize we have to try to close people that don't want to necessarily be closed. And so we go down that road for a while. And then we have a moment like you had yesterday where you realize, wait a minute, you can actually be a nice guy and not try to close. 
and actually close more deals. And that's where the transformation starts to happen in your career, where, where you, you realize that that's the case. However, it's like you can't let go of that closing mentality, cold turkey. And so you kind of go like 25-75, where you're 75% still trying to close hard, but then 25% of you is just trying to listen and help. And then once you want, it's like you don't want to let all the way go of trying to chase deals. But then it comes a point where you're like, this really is working great. Let me go 50-50. And then you go 25-75 the other way. And before you know it, you're at 95-5. 95-5, ladies and gentlemen, is the goal. To be 95% low pressure and 5% high pressure. Whereas now that 5%, you're picking and choosing because remember, you're the shark sitting in the grass. You're watching. You know what's going on. You, they've already told you why they want to sell. You know, you know what their motivations are. You've seen this story play over and over and over again, right? You can tell based on what they said when you asked them why they want to sell if they're actually interested in selling. So too many of us take a prospect and we think we classify them all the same. They're going to sell. Well, that's not the case. Some of them will say, I'll sell or I want to sell, but they don't really want to sell. Well, if you wanted to sell, why are you pricing at fifty thousand over the asking, over over market? You don't really want to sell. You just would sell if. See, some sellers are would sell if this happened, if that happened. Those aren't very motivated sellers. Um, you know, same thing with buyers. You got to be good again communicating, um, and and, th and this is why communication is such a high level skill that everybody needs to focus on as to be the very top thing that you work on, whether it's books you're reading, paying attention on your calls. Um, I made a hundred thousand calls in my career. Um, so I, you know, when I got in real estate, it was 2002, I was 21 and there was no uh, auto dialers. There was no, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Zillow, um, all the gizmos and gadgets and everything that's, sta that's the standard nowadays didn't even exist when I got in the business. That's what's, that's what I, that's, my perspective is interesting because um, I know what it's like not to have any of this stuff. So I, I look at technology and, and where as far as communication has come since the beginning of my career and I see so much opportunity whereas people that are getting into the business now, they don't realize what it was like without these tools and without all this technology and so they don't necessarily appreciate it to the level um, or, or even more so understand how massive of an opportunity it is to do things 10 times faster, right? And to communicate with 10 times more people, um, you know, and build your business literally, you know, 10 times faster. But uh, yeah, again, I don't, I don't remember the question. You know, <laughs> I go off on tangents. So, you know, just That's interrupt, interrupt me if I start to go off on something that doesn't matter. No, no worries. This when we get all the good information is when you're just kind of freestyling what it is you want to say. So I like I like when I get guests that do stuff like that because I'm like we're gonna get some real good stuff today. I mean I mean listen back I do remember the question with real estate agents, right? Let them know you're looking for deals. They're gonna want to help you. Yeah. This is what I'm looking for. Here's my buy box. This is what I like. You know, send me deals. Put me on a drip. Put me on automatic. Call me when you have off market. You know, I'm serious. This is what I do. This is my this is my livelihood. You know, I want to do business with you. Let's go have lunch. Let's get to know each other. I think that's a great, uh, you know, something great. And they they look, look, they may not want to have they may not have time to go sit down with you for lunch or coffee. And don't take offense to that. They're busy. When people ask me to coffee and stuff, it's tough to find time to do that kind of stuff, you know? It's tough. But by God, if I'm not going to send you a property, right, that I think you might buy, you know, and a lot of times, remember, you, you, you get to know people through a transaction. That's where you really get to know somebody. So, you know, don't take offense if they don't have time to have coffee or lunch, you know, still offer it. And if you can, great. But but let that be possibly a red flag if they have time to have lunch or coffee with you. Right. They may not be. A, they, that means that they're not. As, they're not that busy, which might mean something. Right on. Hey, so I want to open it up. It's not just for me. Uh, it's for the other 50 people that are here. Um, you guys want to either um, raise your hand and I'll call you so we can ask some questions for Ricky. Um, as you guys can tell, you're getting some really long, elaborated answers. So, 
So this is a good opportunity with someone with 20 years of experience, right, at a very high level. Aren't you, what, what's the next thing you're speaking at, uh, Ricky? Raise your hand if you have a question. I am, I'll be in Vegas at Ryan Pineda's event next week. Um, speaking on Thursday. And then I'm flying straight to Long Island to do uh, an event there. Then I'm going straight to Orlando. So that's all this month. Good yeah. Then I'm doing a, uh, I'm doing an all day workshop here in my hometown. I'm going to be covering real estate agent, how to become number one, social media, how to build a massive brand, and also real estate investing. Everything from first rental property all the way to syndications. And then, um, yeah, I'm putting together Chicago, Kentucky, Sacramento, you know, it's just going to be boom, boom, boom. So yeah, if that, if you guys ever see, if you, uh, I mean, follow me on Instagram if you guys want there. I answer all my DMs, and um, you can kind of keep up with where I'm going to be when I'm going to be there. I love to see you, shake your hand, all that good stuff. But hey, um, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day, Ricky, to come talk to us tonight. Um, I'd love to get your perspective. Um, I'm brand new to investing, but I'm also almost done with my license, finally. Um, so I'd love to know from your perspective, one, how do you balance your time between investing and being a real estate agent? And then two, pretty much being a real estate agent and being new, what are some things you wish you knew when you started um, to kind of help somebody who is green in the field? Oh, that's, that's beautiful. So with real estate agent versus real estate investor, you know, for me, um, you know, and I don't know your situation, right? You may have a job outside of real estate altogether that pays your bills, right? Is that true? Yes. I mean, okay. So you have a job that pays your bills. So you can literally do this for like 10 years because your bills are taken care of. You can do real estate on the side, investor and real estate agent on the side for 10 years, 20 years, your bills are taken care of. So that's a problem with most agents is they get in and they're in such a hurry to get to real estate full time. If it doesn't happen in six to eight months, they quit. It's like, wait a minute, your bills are taken care of. And if they quit their job to go real estate full time, well, that's just recipe for disaster because if you're putting yourself under the gun to close a deal in six to eight months, and now you're in month four and you're getting desperate, people can hear that in your voice when you're talking to prospects and you, you don't get any deals because they can go find an agent that doesn't sound nervous about their finances, right? And you may, you may not think they hear that, but they do. They can hear the desperation in your voice. And so don't put yourself on a financial pinch that way you can talk to your prospects more freely and coming right back to what I've been talking about the whole time, communication, right? To be able to talk to people without any expectations from the other side. If you're a real estate agent, you need to think of yourself as a volunteer worker, <laughs> like volunteer worker doing community outreach to people in the market to see what you can do to help them, who you are, what you do and what you can do to help, right? And the entire name of the game guys with this is to collect data. You know, why do you think Amazon, Apple, Zillow, Facebook spend billions of dollars on data every single year. It's because data is king, right? They use the data to remarket to us based on the data to sell products. Same thing with us. We need to operate our businesses the exact same way. You need to be in data collection mode every single day, right? You talk to people, you create relationships, you collect their data, you stay in touch with them, right? So um, I'm just kind of breaking it all down really quickly. And that way you can get like a 30,000 foot view. But um, let's see how, which direction can I go with this? With, with first off real estate versus investor, real estate agent, right? That's the path you're going to go, right? You want to really focus on that. It takes so much effort and momentum to get that business rolling that you really need to focus and, and be more of a passive investor. Like if you see a deal, grab a deal. Right, if you see it, get it. That's how I was for a long time. I focused 100% on real estate. I built it up to a million dollars a year, right? And I, I bought little rental properties along the way. But then once I started making big money, then I started buying more real estate. But I, I wasn't really all in with investing. I was kind of like doing it. If I saw a deal, I would get it, whatever. I wasn't like actively trying to be an investor. I was just trying to be a real estate agent who made a million dollars. That was the whole goal. If you focus on trying to build your real estate agent business up to a million dollars a year, you're good. You can you got all the money you need to to invest, and you have a million dollar a year business. You know, but if you let 
investing distracts you from building that million dollar year business, then it could crash and burn the real estate agent business, right? I'm just telling you how I played it. I'm not telling you this is what you need to do. I'm just kind of giving you my story. As far as being a really successful real estate agent, it's real simple, right? You want to make calls all morning, do a weekly email on the same day of the week to, forever to your database, and then do social media and all your marketing stuff in the afternoon. Boom, you're done. Because it, it the number one reason why people choose a real estate agent at the end of a deal, if you ask the buyer or the seller, hey, how'd you pick your real estate agent? The number one response is, I had a friend in the business. And so now we understand that the number one goal, because if you think of how, how closings happen and how people pick agents is they have a friend in the business, our entire objective needs to be, how many friends can I create in the market? How many people can I give warm and fuzzy feelings to that I am truly care about them and I'm their friend, right? More of a friend than any other agent. And so you do that through communication, tone, right? You, you know, and try This is what you guys should try. The next time you're talking to your mom, dad, brother, cousin, best friend from high school, right? During that conversation, take a second while you're listening to them talk and think about how comfortable you are with them, how comfortable they are with you, the tone of your voice, how your shoulders are relaxed, how your heartbeat, everything, how fast you're talking, how slow you're talking, the everything, and take a mental snapshot of exactly how comfortable you are in that situation talking to someone close to you. And I want you to think, this right here is how I need to talk to my prospects. Because if you can talk to them like family, then there's a really good chance that they're gonna do business with you. And it may not be today, but it doesn't matter if it's today. As long as they're going to do business with you, your job is to stack up lifelong loyal clients that are gonna stick with you through your entire career. Not necessarily do a deal today. If you hear that they're trying to do a deal today, great, why? You know, why do you wanna sell this house? This is a beautiful, beautiful place. Why in the world would you sell this place, sir? You know, oh, okay, that makes sense. In that case, here's the game plan. Here's what I think we should do to get you the best results, to help you accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. But I'm not going for the kill. I'm going for the connection. And a lot of agents, they try to convert before they connect. And you can't, you gotta connect first, then convert. You know, after you understand what exactly they're trying to do. But if you, Kia, if you every morning said, I'm gonna make calls until I've created five new friends in the market every day. If you do that, 250 working days a year for five years, you have 6,000 friends in the market. And hopefully you've targeted property owners that own the exact type of property that you wanna sell. Now you have 6,000 friends in the market that own the exact type of property you wanna sell that are getting a weekly email from you on the same day of the week forever. Now, how big is your business at that point? I'll tell you, you're probably in the top 10 of your, of your market. You're probably in the top 10, top five, top 20 of your MLS at that point. Because so many, you're friends with so many people and that's how people choose a real estate agent. But the problem is agents overcomplicate this process and they do it for eight months and they only sell one or two properties or no properties and they just give up. Meanwhile, their database was at 200 and growing, right? They've learned how to write a contract, work MLS, talk to people, right? And you do a transaction but they're discounting all that to nothing. Like, okay, I'll leave you with this since I'm getting long-winded about it. Your first year in real estate, you make millions of dollars. You just haven't cashed in yet. Learning how to work MLS is worth a million dollars to you over the life of your career. Learning how to write a contract is worth a million dollars. Learning how to do a transaction, million dollars. Learning how to talk to someone on the phone, input their data in the database, do a weekly email, million dollars. All these things are worth so much money to you. All these skills are worth so much money to you. And all we're looking at is the tax returns for 20,000 because you did three deals. And you're like, I made 20,000. No, you didn't. You made 4 million. You just hadn't seen it yet. And if you don't give up, you will see it. See what I'm saying? 100%. Thank you. I could really go on and on and on about it, but um but I'm a, all my courses and stuff are 100% free at zero to diamond.com. 60 days that for us, Ricky. You going to post huh? that? 
Well, you can post it in the chat there, the website. Yeah, zero, and, zero to diamond.com. You zero to Instagram. diamond. Put your Instagram channel. Um, oh, shoot. I sent that to you. Hold on. Um, all those courses are totally free. There's a 60 day challenge. And, um, and several other courses, right? There's all my scripts or videos of me making calls, tutorials, the whole nine yards. Everything that I know about being a successful agent is right there. And if you need something, just message me on Instagram. And I'm more than happy to um, help you in any way I can. All right. Guys, raise your hands if you have questions. And I'm just going to ask more questions. All right. Tanner, what's up? What's up, guys? I appreciate you bearing with me and being on screen. I'm at my nine to five, so kind of breaking the rules. So I had a question for you because you said that, you know, oftentimes we get caught up in, you know, closing the deal and what's in it for us. Yeah. What are some basic principles on the phones that we could implement that allows us to kind of remove our selfish desires from the call and really focus on the clients? Like, what are some practical things that you do to keep that in the forefront of your mind when you're on the phone? I'm so glad you asked that, man. So just while I got you, what, give me a typical general script that you're using now so that I can kind of tell you how to tra you know, translate that. So I'm pretty new, so bear with me. Uh, I just been buying leads and calling the last couple of weeks. Yeah. So I said, um, you know, hey, Ricky. Yeah. Hey, Ricky, this is Tanner. I was just getting back to you in regards to the inquiry that you had made on our website about 123 Main Street. Are you still looking to sell that property? Okay. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Perfect. Okay. Well, tell me a little bit about what's going on with it and what led you to punch your information into the website there. Okay. Okay. That's actually pretty good, right? Because you're, you're basically finding out, does he want to sell? And then you're kind of basically, in so many words, you're asking why. You know, like what ha what made you do that? Now, right there is where the rubber hits the road because based on his answer of why he wants to do this, that's where you're gonna take the conversation, you know, whatever way you need to, to help him through whatever. Like he could say, I don't know. Uh, I could, I would, I, you know, I just figured the market's still really high and I would, you know, if I can get this price, I would. Well, that's not a very motivated person if that price is way high and you kind of know kind of how where to go with that you know well sir here's the actual price you know do you actually want to sell you know it doesn't really sound like you do or he might say my daughter's graduating college in three months we don't need the extra bedroom when she leaves we're going to downgrade we want to live on the water and um that's what it is oh great like that's more motivation they may not be in a hurry but still Right, based on the story, guys, if you can get people to tell you stories, they didn't wake up one day and say, I wanna buy something, I wanna sell something for no reason. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's something going on in their life that's causing them to make this decision. And when you can, when you can figure out what that is, that's when you've really started, started to make a connection. And if you can relate to the reason, the real reason behind why they're doing this. When they open up to you and tell you that story, that's when you know that you're heading in the right direction, right? Now, here's what I would do though, Tanner. Um, I would be like, hey, Ricky, hey, Ricky, you know, and, and what what company are you with? Like, what are you saying you're at a company or anything? You're just saying, hey, this is Tanner. Yeah, just Tanner? Yeah. Are you using your last name at all? Or are you, okay. I, I am, but people, I mean, it's not a great last name, so people are like, what? It's a, it's a, I mean, come on, bro. It's, it's an incredible <laughs> last name. Um, so, you know, I would be proud of that name. So, um, but like, w what I would do is I wouldn't necessarily go straight into the pro about the property, right? I would kind of chop it up a little bit because what I'm trying to do here, ladies and gentlemen, is collect data. So when I, when I throw out a question or, or a response of some sort um, to my prospect, I'm listening. I'm trying to hear how they're gonna answer it, right? When it comes to speed of voice, tone, are they up, are they down, are they busy, are they talking fast? What kind of their personality, what's going on here? I can learn all that by just listening to how they respond in the beginning. So when I say, hey, Mr. Johnson, 
Number one, I'm gonna say that with enthusiasm. Hey, Ricky! Because what I want them to do, guys, now hear this. What I, I want them when they answer the phone and they hear me say, hey, Ricky, I want them to think, who the heck is this? But not a who the hell is this, I don't think, a who, like who in the crap is this, but man, this person sounds familiar. I want them to think, who the heck is this? Is it? Is this Johnny? Is this? Is this Lil Bo Pete? Is this? Is this my cousin? <laughs> is this my cousin? Is this my, you know, best friend from high school? Is this <laughs> Johnny? So you know, it's like, hey, Mr. Johnson, you know, hey, Mr. Johnson, it's Tanner. How you doing today? Right? And they're like, oh, I'm doing good. Now a lot of people say, don't say that part. The how you doing? Oh, well, you don't know them, so you don't have the right to ask them how they're doing. Well. How am I gonna begin? How am I gonna get to know them if I don't know how they're doing? <laughs> That's ridiculous. But anyway, I can go around and around with like the mainstream, the gurus, the this and the that's. I've been around the block with all those guys, um, face to face, and on videos and stuff. But I want to know. It, listen, it comes from a place of genuine curiosity. Like I want to know how they're doing. I really want to know because if I can't establish that then I, I'm so genuinely curious about how they're doing. I hate to spend so much time on that part, but it's so so key because listen to me. Hey, Mr. Johnson, he responds and says, hey, I listen to that. I'm like, okay, I'm collecting data. Cool, hey, it's it's Tanner over here. How you doing today? You know, um, and he responds, I'm listening. Since you're not saying a company, he may respond with Tanner with who? Or who, Tanner, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. You can answer that however you want to. And then move into, I like to talk about the weather. Oh, cool. Well, listen, I'm enjoying the day. Isn't it gorgeous? I'm listening for his response. I'm collecting more data before I even get to the sales part of the call at all. I've, I've had so many data collection points already before I even get to the actual part where I want to talk about what I want to talk about. And so now all the data I've collected about how I think he's doing today and how I, because. I've made so many calls that as soon as I, they answer and I can hear that first or second response, I know how the whole call is going to go. I've already, I've already been there and done that. Yeah. And then I'm going to go into, listen, I don't want to take too much of your time today. Now I'm respecting his time. I'm not asking him if now's a good time. If I ask and he may say, no, it's not a good time. Well, why did you answer the phone? <laughs> like, why did you answer the phone then if it's not a good time? So I don't have to ask him if it's a good time. I know it's a good time because he answered, but I still want to respect his time. So I want to I want to make a statement. Hey, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I saw that you were tinkering around on our website or whatever about your house. I was just calling about that and seeing if you're still interested in possibly selling. Right? And then I like what you did after that. You went into trying to investigate and do discovery on why they're thinking about selling. So that's cool. I appreciate it. That helps. Just, just listen. Slow play it. Roll like slow roll it. Like, and if you go in there slow, and they're like, "What? What? What do you want? What? What's going on?" It's like, "Well, hold on, sir. Like, I'm just calling you to see how you're doing. Number one, I know you have a house here that you might be interested in selling. That's why I was calling." If you just want to get to the point, see when people react that way, then it makes me react a certain kind of way because I know that I'm here for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, sir. Well, listen, I'm calling to see what I can do to help you today. It sounds like you're having a really bad day. Right? So what can I do to help you, man? You know, like I love running into those type of people that want to try to stereotype me as somebody who's just trying to be a taker because I'm the exact opposite. And I'm, and I'm ready to stand up for that. See, when you, when you, when you're, when your intentions are so pure to try to help the other person, you get into a place where you could care less what other people think and how they're going to react to you. Because if they react to you negatively, I'm going to bring it right back to them because they don't know me. I'm here to help them, whether they want to believe it or see it or think it. That's what I'm there for. And I'll fight with them about it <laughs> if I have to. And I've won a lot of people over like that because they realize, wait a minute, this guy just trying to help. And then a lot of them, you know, that are in that mindset, they're just stuck. They'll just never believe that people actually want to help other people. But that's okay, right? Because it becomes a, a numbers game forever. So have confidence in 
your intentionality for the call. 100%. 100%. And base all your questions off of genuine curiosity. Exactly. Like Walk into every call, not giving an absolute flying shit what anybody thinks. That was, a, that was probably my favorite part of the call so far. Was really I was going to say another word, but I didn't want to go that far with it. Oh, good, oh, good. Next, who's got the next question? Thanks for the question, Tanner. That was really good, man. It's a really good question. Who's got the next question? Raise your hand or unmute yourself. What you got? We got Ricky for about 10 more minutes, so I know you, I know you cut it off the family time at five. That's right. So, good stuff right there. I'm not, I'm not there yet. I used got, to, I used to not be there. I used to work till 10, 11 o'clock at night every night. I worked 15 hours for 15 years. And I loved it, dude. I mean, I was doing what I loved to do. So I, I wouldn't go back and change that at all. But you do get to a place where, you know, my daughter's three and, you know, I want to hang out with the family and I can afford to do so. Yeah, no, I love that. I'm plus, you, plus you learn how to be more efficient, right? You learn how to get more done between nine to five. You know, as you become more experienced and you've tried, you, you've, you've A-B tested, you know, um, activities that produce results. If you, if you're a good adapter, then you get to where you've built machines and systems around everything where you actually get a lot more done. Um, there's four keys to success. There's believe, you have to believe 100%. If you believe less than 100%, if you believe 99.99%, chances are it's not gonna work. There's work hard. Right, and so a lot of people believe, but out of the people that really believe, not very many actually work hard behind the belief. They believe all day long, but they don't put any effort or execution behind it, or they're not consistent. So you gotta believe, then you gotta work hard, then you have to adapt. So, you know, a lot of people believe, you know, very few believe and work hard, and then out of that group that believe and work hard, not too many of them also adapt. So they just keep doing the same stuff every year and they just keep making the same money and they never really expand or grow their business because they're not adding, they're not testing and adding and being more efficient to what they're doing. And then the fourth key is patience. In 2015, I made 600 grand as an agent. The next year I wanted to make a million dollars. And I said, hell, here's the plan. I'm gonna make this many calls, go on this many listing appointments and get this many listings and close this many deals. That's gonna equal a million dollars. Boom, January 1st, I started executing the plan. By March, I realized I'm only gonna make 50, uh, I'm gonna, I was only making 50,000 a month. I, I'm only gonna make 600 again. Um, I couldn't do that big of numbers. To, to scale up to that point. And I was like, as depressed as someone can be making 600 grand that year, right? And so I went out and hired a coach and the coach basically just reinforced that what I, everything I was doing was right. And um, that was the year I had to learn patience. So up to that point, I believed, I worked hard and I adapted, but the part I was missing was patience. And it took me to 2017, so 14, 15, 16, and then finally 17, I hit that mill, um, and so what I had to realize in 2014 is that I'm doing everything right, I just need to keep pushing forward, and I, I will eventually get there, and it took three more years. That's a long time, all right? That's a long time, um, but you know, you have, to, you have to play the long game, guys. It's such a long game, um, but when you look back after you hit it, you realize it wasn't that long. It just feels long when you're in it, you know? That's a really good piece of advice. I can agree with that. I did 13 years in the army, so like it felt like a long time for me waiting to get out. And I got out, and I was like, really, that was eight months. And 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 and, then, and like when we get into that part of the conversation, we get into the part of the conversation where we become, we get into our 60s and 70s and 80s, where we're getting to the end of our life, right? And then and then shit gets real. And then you realize, okay, like on my whole life was a snap of a finger. Welcome to the call. Hi, so I I was, I was agree with some of the stuff that you said earlier in the call. Um, I too don't really like to, to flip and I've never done a true flip. I, I'm usually more of like burr or buy and hold, but I was just curious what your um, percentage breakdown is in your business as far as um, how much flips you do versus buy and hold. And what else you do? Like I've done, I've dabbled in a little of everything. I've done a, a deal with Naaman. I've done a little lending. I've done 
um, flipping our own uh, rental properties where my husband and I are swinging hammers and painting and we're still married. <laughs> so anyway, just crazy. I, uh, I pretty much flip a house a month, I guess, on average. Uh, I'll normally have like maybe like three to five happening at once just because they kind of overlap each other, you know, with buying them and uh, renovating them and getting them on the market and stuff. And like right now, I've got some that are kind of sitting on the market, you know, that should have sold, <laughs> but, um, but that's okay. I'm in them really good. You know, when you buy stuff at the courthouse, you know, you get a good deal and I make sure I'm buying stuff, you know, really cheap. Um, and so I have my stopping point on the auctions and I don't, I don't go out and, you know, prospect to, to flip houses. Um, you know, I just buy them at the courthouse. It's easy. I see, I see them coming up and I can check them out and see what I think they're worth, see what I'm willing to bid, pay cash for those. See, see guys, in 2003 and four and five, I made a mill um, as a really, you know, my young, my, my early 20s. And I took that money and started flipping. But the problem was I, I was leveraging to flip. So I'd buy a house, go into debt, flip the house, buy two houses, go into debt, buy four houses, sell those, go into debt. And I would keep flipping. Um, and then when the market crashed, I got caught, I had about a million and a half worth of debt. And I just, that's how I lost everything I own. They took my house, they took my car. I was sleeping in a car that my friend gave me, sleeping on people's couches, eating out of people's refrigerators, roofing houses and working on an oil rig and serving tables. Um, and so I'll never borrow money to flip a house ever again. That's fine if you guys do. I'm just never going to do that. I don't have to. I have cash and I'm going, if, if I'm going to flip a house, if I'm going to, if I want it to do a short term profit, that's where you can get into trouble. It's more risky and I'm not going to risk that situation. Now, if I get, but the cool thing is, is if I buy a flip and I paid cash and I do get caught, I can rent it out and take out an equity line and then take that tax free money and go buy and go buy another rental. So I win either way, right? Um, but again, I'm not a big fan of it. I would rather do something else with my money, buy you know long-term rentals and stuff, and um, not flip. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna normally do about one a month, and then I don't know. Like personally, I probably buy 20, 30 doors a year, something like that. Duplexes, fourplexes, single families, commercial buildings, stuff like that. So, um, but now I'm getting into syndication stuff. I mean, I'm, you know, my goal this year is to buy a hundred million dollars worth of stuff. And I mean, I'm looking for deals now, um, Florida, Alabama, anywhere in the Southeast, really 10 to a hundred deals. I mean, 10 to a hundred units, anything I can find, I'm looking at, I'm underwriting. And the, the problem is everything's overpriced right now. I mean, it's like, you're, you're the luckiest man in the world. If you find a six cap, it's like six is like as big as I've found lately. Um, and I've looked at a lot of deals and the numbers just they're not that great at 6% cap uh, On these deals and I remember the days where you know, you were looking at 7 to 10% caps and those numbers were great You're looking at an 8 or 9 cap on something You just don't see it anymore just because prices went up so much. So we'll kind of see what happens You know as this interest rate thing hits the uh, commercial market with the adjustable rate mortgages that are sitting out there Maybe we'll see some deals. I'm hoping we do you know uh, we'll just kind of have to see how it all plays out, but that's kind of where I'm at right now as far as my balance between flips and, you know, rentals. That um, sounds like you're diversified well in real estate. Yeah, that, that's the whole point. The flips, and I mean, that's kind of what I've done. Um, might have been more burrs, buy and hold, and now I have a couple of properties that I'm doing medium-term rentals, so travel yeah. versus thing um and then some lending also but um i just for the last three months we really haven't you know done much of anything we've been just taking it easy but anyways um i don't blame you you know i don't blame you just like let's let the market settle out figure out where we stand you know yeah it's no need to be in a hurry um you know but i mean just to give you my two cents on the market Right, so every single year, inventory skyrockets and then plummets every year since 2000. I mean, if you go back, back to 2014, it skyrockets, plummets, skyrocket, plummets, and it's went up this year. Um, 
just like it did last year and the year before. Nobody talks about that. And now it's trending down and we're gonna see it come down. And we're only half of where we were pre-pandemic and it's fixing to go down. We're gonna have a massive inventory shortage, massive. And demand is still extremely high, especially, I mean, if you look back to 2008, we're double the demand we were back then with less than half of the supply. It's nuts, the situation that we're in. But I don't know a guru on earth that thinks that inflation is gonna be the same or go up. Everybody's basically in agreement that it's coming down. As it comes down, 30 year fix will come down because it follows inflation and the 10 year treasury. And, um, and so what we're gonna see is buyers come out the woodworks once it hits a level that everybody's comfortable with. But as buyers are waiting on that to happen, inventory is plummeting. So once all the buyers become comfortable and come out the woodworks, there's not gonna be any houses for sale. And everybody's gonna be fighting over the same house. We're gonna be right back at the same problem we were two years ago. Um, so the only other X factor is um, wage growth. If it stays over 5% and inflation goes below that, it could create a, uh, a second wave of inflation because people are spending more. I think that's highly unlikely because feds are gonna keep rates up until they get a hold of wage growth. But the only other thing is iBuyer. The, uh, the inventory iBuyers are sitting on, if they unload that property, people think that that could be a negative impact on the uh, housing market. I don't see, I think it would be a positive impact because we're so in need of inventory. I think, um, and we're only talking about select cities, like there's no iBuyer inventory here where I am, but um, you know, select big cities that have large inventories of, uh, uh, and, and I say large, like they made up like 20% of the, you know, of sales last year. Okay, that's not 20% of all the homes in America, that's 20% of last year's sales. Right, so that we had five million sales, we're talking about a million sales. So a million, you know, households in America out of, I don't know how many households there are, but you got 350 million people in the US. Um, we're talking about such a small percentage, it's almost like a microscopic dot in the whole scheme of, of everything. But if they flooded the market with it, they would do something. I just think buyers would be happy because there would be choices. Agents would be happy because they would have something to sell. Sellers would be happy because they're waiting, they want to move to their dream home and they can't find it. There's no inventory, you know? So I don't, I don't see yeah, how in the very, world. It's very um, specific to the, the location, places like Phoenix right now, yeah. you know, it's being just like swamped with uh, sellers right now. And yeah. um, a lot of people, they, they did a lot of building and now there's no buyers because of the interest rates. And then a lot of uh, yeah people that own rental property are starting to just sell because oddly enough, rent is going down in some yeah. areas. Yeah, it went up so much. I yeah. mean, you know, it just went up so much. But, you know, buyers, I think, need to take a look around right now and think two to one buy downs. Um, you know, take 2% down on the first year, 1% on the second year, or even 3-2-1. There's 3-2-1 buy downs, 3% less. Or if you don't like that, you can get a 1% permanent buy down. And go out right now where there's no competition from other buyers. Sellers are willing to negotiate. You can even get the seller to pay for the buy down and go out there and get something at a 5 or even a 4% interest rate uh, right now and go ahead and, you know, find what you want before interest rates come down and inventory comes down with it and all the buyers come out at once. Because you say there's no buyers and you're right, they're not buying, but they're still there. It's just yeah. it's just yeah. pinned, pinned up. Like it, like, now, yeah. I get that some buyers have said, okay, let me make adjustments. Okay, the market changed. Let's just not buy for a couple of years. There's, pl there's definitely plenty of buyers that we're gonna buy that made, it, made arrangements that they can hang out for a year or two somewhere else and they're off the table. So I get that it did kill some short-term demand permanently, but there's still so much demand, ridiculous demand, right? So I, I just, I'm excited about 2023. Um, this is what you guys need to do, okay, right here. You, you need to look at worst case scenarios. Think about worst case scenarios, okay? So like in our mind, okay, prices go down 50%. Let's just think that, Good. I mean, would all of you agree maybe that could be a worst case scenario? Like complete worst? Could it get any worse than that? 2000, 2008 was 50%, right? So that, I mean, 
50% would be like an atomic bomb hit the market and this is worst case, right? Right, so we, we know one thing, it's never gonna go to zero. Never gonna go to zero, and it's never gonna, there's, there's gonna be closings every single day by the truckloads, no matter what happens for the rest of our life, every single day. 9-11, dot com crash, pandemic, closings happen every single day through some of the most scary moments in our, in our history, our economic history. There's nothing to worry about there. It's just a matter of how you're gonna capitalize. And so if in the back of your mind, you're always looking at what the worst case scenario is, and then you visualize what you're gonna do if worst case happens to crush it, then now you're not worried about anything because chances of worst case happening is so slim. And so if you're prepared for that and it's better than that, then you're really gonna crush it. And so that's what you all need to do. So let's think about it. Prices go down 50%. Okay, prices go down 50%. What then? How do we how do we maximize? How do we capitalize on that? Well, if you're a real estate agent, how hard is it going to be to sell properties at half price? You'll have less buyers, but the buyers are going to be extremely happy about getting in houses for 50% off, right? I was selling in 2008 when prices were 50% less, and let me tell you something. My clients were happy. And they and they weren't hard to find. Hey, real estate's half off. Anybody want in? <laughs> oh yeah. People come out the woodworks. I don't care how bad the economy is. Um, investors, what are you gonna do? I'll tell you what you're gonna do. <laughs> you're gonna buy some property. If it goes down 50%, you're now an owner. <laughs> you're, not, you're not an investor anymore, you're an owner. You're gonna own a bunch of property, all right? Um, if you're a buyer, you're happy. If you're an agent, you're happy. If you're a seller, you're happy because now you're you're wanting to upgrade. Go upgrade. And, and, and if you're a seller and it goes down 50%, you're not interested in, in, in upgrading. That means you're not selling. So you don't care. You know in five years it's going to be worth more. You know in 10 years it's going to be worth more. You don't care if it goes down this year. You're not selling. So you see guys, worst case scenario, it's fine. It's not a big deal. Now, it's not gonna happen. So then what? Well, if we're prepared for worst case scenario and, and it only goes down five, 10%, then we're really gonna crush it. Are y'all with me? All right, so again, I don't know you guys really well or you know, as far as individually and the people that haven't spoke and stuff like that, I don't know if you're optimistic about the market, pessimistic about the market or what your stance is on everything. And, um, you know, if anybody has any last minute thoughts or um, feedback or comments, now will be the time. All right. Looks like we're good then. Beautiful. Thanks, Ricky, for coming out, man. This was awesome, dude. I really Enjoyed appreciate it. the different things you hit the different points to sell in the agents the market like there was a bunch of information that we squeezed out of you in this quick hour so i really appreciate you for coming on pouring into us sharing the information and making yourself available um everybody go follow ricky on instagram see uh what events he's going to where is he going to be at like he said he'll he'd love to meet you shake your hand talk to you at the event so nothing like meeting people in person these are cool but there's nothing better than meeting somebody in person and doing some business that way and also make sure you ricky where can they send these deals to they find 10 to 100 units in florida or, or alabama florida where they send the deals to you at if you guys, if you guys find, find a, deal, a deal or have a, or deal, have a deal off market on market anything, anything um, um you can send you it to me on Instagram if you want to, want to or you can email, or you can email it, to email me, it to me, ricky at ricky zero to diamond dot com. Dot com. Um, um, I get a ton, I get a of, email. ton of emails though. Um, so it's hard to kind of sift through some of that. If you do try to send me a deal, just put capital RRR in the subject and I'll try to see it like that. I'll, I definitely see every Instagram message though. Yeah, I'm just um, so text messages, but all the IG stuff is like easy to keep up with. If you if you uh, if you email me something, then send me a message on IG and say, hey, I just emailed you something, and that way at least I'll see that you email me something. I'll go try to find it or whatever. All right. Awesome. All right, brother. Thanks again for for coming out, man. Thank you everybody for showing up. 
Let's keep building this community, keep connecting, because we make money with the more people we waste our time with. All right, later, Ricky. Uh, I love what you guys are doing, man. Great questions, and um, it, I really enjoyed hanging out with you guys, a good group. So um, looking forward to coming back later on in the year or something. We can chop it up again. Absolutely. We will. Be, I'll be in touch. All right, bro. See you guys. I want to, I want to. Look. I-35 with the top down, quit to tell a hater they should get like me. Seem like everybody 